Uh, this is the topic, just by way of background on me. Hold on, let me clip this on something. Uh, I appreciate, uh, thanks to everyone here that's sort of part of this Sastra community. Uh, you know, by way of quick background, I was CEO and co-founder of EchoSign, was acquired by Adobe. Uh, from inception, the, the EchoSign and the Adobe Web Services business will do over 100 million this year. So I sort of experienced that journey, a lot of it on the other side of the acquisition, unfortunately. Um, and we shared a lot of those learnings back on Saster. Now we've get, we got over 300,000 uh, views a month on our content in general. And on Quora, we're, Saster is the fifth most popular content. So when you think that only we write about, only write about SaaS, that's, that's pretty cool. So thank, thanks, everyone, for the support uh, there. Um, and now I'm, uh, I've, I'm, I'm investing in companies as a, in SaaS as a managing director at Storm. Uh, which invested in me and Marketo and Mobile Iron and lots of other folks uh, in recurring revenue very early. Um, so that's me, and the topic uh, that maybe we can be interactive on is how to hire your, your first VP of sales. And uh, what, just, I'll only ask one audience question, but how many people have worked with the VP of sales that didn't work out? <laughs> uh, yeah, oh, only half, okay. Um, well, if we go to the, or, uh, do I have a clicker? Yeah. Ah, forward is completely counterintuitive. Okay, very good. Uh, well, at the top, I'll just say my non-scientific study of about 80 startups is about 70% of the SaaS VP of sales don't make it 12 months. Um, and what I learned is, you know, that, that, that's a terrible number, right? Uh, as a, from a CEO or founder's perspective, it's a disaster because it's your fault. Uh, I feel like at least for the first 50 employees, anyone that doesn't work out is your fault, right? You, you screened them. You made the decision, and, and shame on you. So why is there such a high attrition rate? Um, and it turns out, actually, the problem's even worse than that. It's not just that they don't work out. The problem is when you hire the VP of sales, right? Uh, sometimes you'll hire the VP of sales on day one. I guess that does happen. But the more common pattern for a SaaS company is you get a little bit of something going, right? You get to 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 MRR sometimes. Wherever you are, you get 100, 1,000 customers. Maybe you've got a couple reps and you want to, and you've, you've, it's outgrown your skills or your time to manage them, you bring someone in. Wherever you are, if you make their wrong hire, it just dramatically decelerates your progress. It's a disaster, right? Um, and I made that mistake myself, and I'll, I'll walk through the mistakes I made on this chart. Um, uh, I, I, I did make a, a mistake for the first VP of sales. I, I got attracted to sort of Mr. Dashboards and Ms. Go Big, which I'll chat about. Um, and what I learned from this process in, in, in sales, especially up to a certain point, 10, 20 million in revenue, is a CIO got obsessed with the metric of revenue per lead. Okay, it took me a long time to figure this out. But uh, once you have that inbound meeting going, as we were just talking about, the leads come in, what's your revenue per lead? And I think ultimately, at least up to a point in, in, in your SaaS startup, that's the job of the VP of sales. However they get done is to increase the revenue per lead. And we went through sort of our bad year, our, 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 our year of hell. Um, and what happened in the year of hell is, is our, we, you know, we had a bunch of traction. Maybe we were doing two million, less than two million at the time of getting there. And our, and our growth sort of flattened. And I, I really didn't know what was happening. Was it like the Lehman Brothers stuff and the economy? I just, I really didn't know. Um, it didn't work. Um, and then, uh, I still didn't know. And then that didn't work out. Uh, and I hired our real VP of sales, uh, Brendan Cassidy. And he comes in. Uh, for the job, uh, and I say, Brendan, I, I, I'm a totally transparent guy, I gotta be honest with you. I say, if we don't double revenue in 90 days, we're going bankrupt. <laughs> and he looks at me, he looks at the numbers, he's like, I've never seen this many leads at this stage. <laughs> he says, no problem, right? So turn around, and not saying anything was easy, but in 90 days, uh, our revenue was doubled, and the way that really happened was our revenue per lead went up, it doubled. Um, and so I kinda wanna walk through a lot of those learnings quickly, and maybe we can share war stories here, because it's fun. Um, but I was asked to speak on this topic. I think the problem that almost all tons of SaaS first-time founders make again and again is you, know, you get attracted to the name, right? You want to hire someone from Salesforce or LinkedIn uh, or maybe punch, poach someone out of HubSpot or, uh, or Dropbox. Um, and that's great, but it's highly unlikely that those, that those folks did it, right? It's, it's more likely if you hire someone out of Salesforce. Matt, how, what was the revenue when you were there? 600 people, even that's a little, a little, a little big, right? Uh, you know, Yammer was sizable when you went, right? Going from there to scripted without a, a rest stop in between can be challenging, right? But you're attracted to that. 
The, the problem with a lot of the guys, the other guys, is they don't, they don't have that experience, right? They worked at some startup, um, and you know they won't scale. So how do you, how do you resolve this, this paradox? Um, I don't know the perfect answer, um, but what you really want at the end of the day to find is someone like Brandon or Matt that's done, done all of it, right? Because you end, up, you, know, you end up just hiring someone that looks good to your board, but they end up being Mr. Dashboards, right? They're good at doing that piece. Um, they're good at going big, but they don't know this phase, which is make it repeatable. Um, the other problem that I see a lot is if you, don't, you hire this guy to do this, it's too big of a jump. The, the other one that really attracts us a lot is what I, is what I and others call the evangelist, right? Sometimes this is, a, this, is a, this is someone that they're super smart, right? Super high IQ. They're great middlers, right? They can talk about your product forever. High IQ, you love working with them. And you ask them how many salespeople they've managed, and they kind of fudge the answer, right? Well, there was a team of 30, right, or 20 or 10. And, and you dig in, and they've only directly managed a handful of people, right? And so that's a huge, a huge risk hire, because will they really be able to scale and hire a larger team? Um, I don't know the answer, but I think what I've learned is nine times out of 10, Mr. Dashboards doesn't work out in a, in a startup that's before, say, 10 million in revenue. And the evangelist, if you hire them maybe five times out of 10, they have to transition, right? They become business development or partnership or something else. But when it comes time to scale, uh, they don't pan out. So number one reason I think 70% of them don't work out is, is wrong stage. Um, the other thing I realized uh, going to some of the other talks is, is, is you start too late. This one took me a while to figure out. Um, but, um, you know, when you go to hire, when you're ready to hire a VP of engineering, that's a unicorn hire. Um, a VP of marketing, too, demand gen's a unicorn hire. But if you actually find the right person at the right time for them, and you have the most amazing product, like as John was talking about, you can convince them, right? You have to sell the dream. The, the challenge with a lot of great VP of sales candidates, in my learning, I, I didn't really realize this before, is there's obviously much less incentive to jump, right? If you're making huge cash, and you're already a director of VP of sales to someone else, you've got it dialed in, even if the job has become boring or stale because your company got bought by Microsoft or Adobe or Google or whatever. It's so dialed in that, that even if the most exciting company comes along, what's the incentive to jump, right? The more incentive is to wait. See what happens for three months, six months, 12 months. You'll probably still get the same amount of equity, right? The company will improve, and maybe by then, they can close the gap on cash. So I, I think the real problem is you don't decide to hire that VP of sales until the week or the month that you need them, and that has a huge impact on the candidate pool, right? And so I think my Uber learning is when you have 10 customers, you should start recruiting a VP of sales, right? And even if it, it's just meeting people, coming here, talking to people, it may take you 12 months until you can show the right candidate that it's time to jump. Um, and when I look back, uh, with Brendan, I realized it took 20 months to recruit him. Now, I, if I'd actually tried more actively, maybe I could have done better, right? But he was my customer. I got to know him at LinkedIn. Um, and then, somewhat coincidentally, but when the time was right, we already had a relationship. We had enough of a base that it was a good, good role for him, and, and you get him, right? But rec recruit that guy in one day, one week, 30 days, I, I, I just think today it's, it's impossible. So you, you start too late. And, and as John said, spend 20% or 50% of your time recruiting. I think for this role, you just got to start way early and, and just be constantly talking to folks in the space. Um, and then, maybe this is obvious to a lot of folks. Um, it, I, I knew it, but when I talk to so many people, this is the other reason the VP of sales thing just, just falls flat on their face, because they have this really cool product, and what they want the VP of sales is to be the magician, right? I, I did the product. Your job is, is to go get the revenue, right? Um, and I think that that could work for the evangelist. But what, you have a conflict here, because I think, as we all know, this, this, I sort of force ranked my list of what a great, true VP of sales does. Uh, and number one is recruiting a team, right? Number one is putting the team together, and whether it's training them and managing them, however you're going to do, get the people in and manage them to success. Down five, which isn't even on this chart, is closing, right? Because as soon as you've even got a couple million of recurring revenue in this company, the VP of sales cannot be working on most deals, right? They can probably, maybe they won't even work on any deals depending on your deal size, or maybe just a handful of your biggest deals. So the huge mistake so many founders make, especially if their background is product, is they want a player coach. You know, I'm not ready, it's so expensive. You know, I'll have this guy, he'll, hold, he'll have an e equal quota with the rest of the team, that might be okay. But uh, it's so far down on the list. And so thinking through it, what you really want is, is the world's best manager that's a good fit for your ACV and, and for the, life, the time of your company, right? Recruiting, building in the team, helping the rest of the team, figuring out tactics, which we've chatted about today, 
strategy, and then I really feel like uh, sales is fifth. Um, and uh, maybe others disagree, but I think this is not obvious for a lot of people. And I think this is why so many people make this, this wrong mistake. Um, and uh, the magician just, he just doesn't show up. Um, and I, I learned the clear sign in the magician is pipeline. And so when you're bigger, uh, when you're at 20 million or larger, pipeline is this sort of a wonderful thing. Um, but the clearest sign that at early stage, at a couple million revenue, VP sales isn't going to work out is all you hear about is pipeline, right? Um, when you're doing a million in revenue and the guy generates, the, or, the, or, or she generates 10 million in pipeline in 90 days, you know you're dead, right? Um, it's just because all that matters here is revenue. Nothing else matters. It's closing. Um, so uh, the, 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 I, I wish I had the perfect answer to how to deal with this, but I think in the interviewing process, if all you hear in early stage is pipeline, 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 and all you see is pipeline, pipeline, and nothing else, uh, those guys just, they just uh, never work out. The pipeline keeps growing and the, and the revenue doesn't close. Um, and then sort of my last thing, you know, and I'd be curious other people's thoughts about it, but the last, you know, for so many SaaS startups, hiring the VP of sales becomes this, this hyper stressful situation. And if you look at this data, um, which is certainly not biased toward the Bay Area or, you know, tech centers, what's the average comp for VP of sales? Well, it's about $300,000 and up, right? It's possible it's even slightly higher than that at, at uh, hot startups. It could be a lot more, right? How can you possibly afford to pay this, right? Because if the VP of sales isn't going to have a quota, this is going to be a huge, a huge cost center. And they want to hire a bunch of reps. All of a sudden, the cash just seems, just seems uh, out, uh, out the door. And you have this other problem, if you look at it. They're hiring these VP of sales, and they're getting all base <laughs> and a relatively low percent of bonus. So they're taking home a huge amount of guaranteed cash and doing their best efforts to get there, to hit their OTE. Um, and so I'll chat about this, but this is a stress point. And I think the key thing, and this is, maybe ever, most people in the room know this, but I, but I know it's not obvious, is to de-stress this whole situation. You've got, your VP of sales has to be accretive. Okay, it has to be accretive. And, and that's easy to say, I'll talk about it in a second, but I don't believe the way to accretive is to give them a full quote in a bag for 12 months. That, that's not accretive. Um, uh, but what you want to know is that whatever you pay your VP of sales, um, the VP of sales is going to bring in a multiple of that revenue back to the company. That's accretive, right? And so there's only two ways you can do that. Uh, one, again, is the bag. I don't think it works. And the second way is the metric we talked about, increasing revenue per lead, right? If you're, if you're, doing, a, if you've got, if you're doing two million and you've got you know, potential to do a million next year and that VP of sales increases it to $1,500,000, uh, he, he or she's more than paid for itself. So that's why, at least in the early days, I just think this metric is so important because this is the way this, this really stressful hire that doesn't work out 70% of the time, can, you can completely de-stress it um, and, and, uh, and, and understand is the key is making it a creep. Um, so my kind of summary, um, and then I, you know, I'd love to open it up to other talks, is okay, so those are the, you know, usually try and talk about all the good things. Those are some of the challenges of making the hire while they don't work out. Again, you know, my summary of what are my learnings to make it work. Uh, we talked about start early. I, I really do think that 10 customers is the time to start. Um, especially as a founder CEO, it's got to be a huge part of your job. The second one, which is sort of the impossible paradox, but don't settle, right? You, you, want, you want that LinkedIn or Salesforce or Dropbox DNA on the resume, but if they don't have some experience, at least at the next stage, and I think here's where you can give. If, if you're doing 2 million and they've done 10 million up, that's fine, you'll be there soon enough, right? If you're doing two million and they've done 200 million and up, it just won't work, right? And so you can't settle, it's impossible, but you've gotta be meeting with as many people as you can for a year or longer, and eventually, if you're tenacious, I think you'll make it work. Um, and then do it yourself first, probably this audience knows that, I think that's a classic founder mistake they make, they haven't done it themselves, and they wanna bring in the magician to solve it. You've gotta close a couple big customers yourself or you'll have no idea what you're doing with this hire if you haven't done it before. Um, and then the, the fourth one, which you know, I've, I've blogged about and talked about, um, and it's worth spending some time on, I, I believe it's very important, and this is a big mistake you can make, and start to pay very well, right? And so how do you, if you're doing a million in revenue, how do you pay a VP of sales or over two million, right? Um, well, if the, if the hire isn't accretive, it's, it's impossible, right? There's, there's no way to do it. Um, but if you pay essentially on performance, if the, if the bonus is extremely generous, right, if the percent of the deal size that the reps take home and that ultimately also your VP of sales gets from your overall company deal, 
you can actually afford to pay very well, right? So I, I've talked about this. The general program that we worked out at EchoSign, which de-stressed my life dramatically once, once we got our act together, was we basically paid our reps um, double what you might think it would get. So for example, we paid our reps on average about 25% of the ACV they brought in. And if you look at a lot of SaaS companies, it, it's less than the, the higher deal size. But if you look at most SaaS companies, it's about half that, right? But what we did is we put in a program where they had to pay for themselves. And until they paid for their fully burdened cost, they didn't get any bonus, right? And so if you hit sort of your quota, it's kind of similar to what you're going to get at some other company, right? Where you get maybe, you know, 12 and 12 or 10 and 10. But if you blow it out, you can make a huge amount of money. Um, and so create a virtuous cycle where the folks that make huge amounts of money automatically are profitable for you, right? And what this meant for me as a CEO is since Brandon had a recruiting engine in place, I knew every single hire would be accretive, at least after a couple months. That means I didn't have to worry about any of this. I didn't have to worry about how much money they were making. I didn't have to worry about money going out the door. All I had to worry about was that our revenue per lead was kept going up, um, and that however many people needed to be hired to service that, it was there was no stress and no issues. So, so paying better than than you than you intuitively think, but paying for success, I think, is key. And then this last one, I know this one sounds like blindingly obvious. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it for last. I, I see so many founder CEOs hire a VP of sales with a great resume or, or looks really good in a jacket, uh, you know, six foot five, whatever the look is, um, but there's no, there isn't trust, right? They're, they're so desperate to get someone in help, there isn't trust. And I think, I'm not sure why this is. Um, for other positions, I think trust is a prerequisite up to a certain point. But if you don't have trust, it's, it's just too hard to go into war every day, right? You're, you, you're, you're, you're a team. Um, and without that, you've just got to pass. Um, but uh, those are my learnings on, on sort of the unicorn. But I think if you do that, you create kind of this amazing culture. Um, and it just, it just builds on itself. Um, so any, any thoughts there? Or any, any, any war stories on, on these hires? Or things you figured out better than your boss or your boss did? Yeah. You know, maybe others have like the world's most perfect answer. I'll tell you what we what we did, right? Um, which is first, you have to decide, you know, at the margin, how important cash is to your company, right? Uh, because the, you know, for at least for a startup, a multi-year contract is a gift from heaven, <laughs> right? I remember we were doing what's that? Cash up front. And when we were doing like thirty thousand dollars a month, we got this, this huge check. We blew it on the office. We got this four hundred thousand dollar check. I mean, that was a that extended the runway like six months right there back at, back in the day, right? And then you get to the point where it simply doesn't matter, right? Whether you're cash flow positive or, or you're so big, you have so much capital, whatever, it just, it just doesn't matter, right? So, so as an independent company, before our acquisition, cash did matter. We, were, we did something which is pretty tough to do, which is we grew over 100% a year in SaaS with a sales driven model and was cash flow positive after 4 million ARR. And basically what we ended up doing, there were variances and, and at the end of the day, my VP of sales did whatever he wanted to do and it was all good. But the rough structure was to give people half of the commission on the outline years that they'd otherwise get. If you kind of sync doing the math, they're probably going to give a discount anyway on the multi-year contract. It's not the hugest. It's not going to incent horrible behavior to ram it down their throat. Um, but it's enough so that they'll, they'll, make it, that they'll ask for it and try and get it. What's that? Contract value? For every company on the planet or for whom? Oh, you mean for, for yeah, how, how much, how much? Uh, I'm curious other people's thoughts. I'm not sure it matters. Um, I mean, obviously, at some extent, it matters, right? The, 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 when, the, when the deals start to get into the seven figures or, or the mid-six figures, people, people are expecting to take home a lot of pay. And ultimately, the larger deal size is the, you know, if you, oops, sorry, down is up, but uh, no matter. Um, people are going to be expecting higher comp. But I think, um, but I think for, most, for a lot of business, especially across multiple segments, um, 
you have some natural issues or floors, which is that it's very hard, you know, other people may have other examples, maybe at HubSpot, or I had an interesting conversation at Zendesk about how they do very low price point sales. They do it with stay-at-home moms and dads. <laughs> um, but for most folks, unless your price point's around four or 5,000 ACV, you can't afford to have a sales rep, right? There's just only so many demos you can do a month and so many you can do a close, right? So you, you get that five-figure, that four-figure tier, right? Transactional sales, you get that five-figure, that 20, 40, 50,000 that kind of Brian Jacobs talked about where it's it's important thing and then you get six figures. But I think, um, you know, maybe to back into it, I think what you generally see is, is when you're in the, that, that four figure range, it's hard to hit in most cases a quota more than like four to five or 600,000, right? When you get in that five figure and up, hopefully a rep when your business is going can hit a 800 or a million quota and up from there and, and I think you can back into it. Yeah. Uh, can you ask that just a little bit louder for my old ears? Uh, I, you know, in my experience, I think it's, uh, you know, not, we could talk about the topic more broadly. For me personally, I think it's one of the most important things in the world, right? I basically sat, not in the middle, but adjacent to the sales team, right? The whole sales team listened to me, we listened to each other, at least when the team was smaller, right? And I, you know, at least up until you're maybe 10 million in revenue, you know, maybe and always, in fact, you learn so much from the sales team, it's so interactive, right? So you want to be together. Um, having said that, you know, uh, I, I think a challenge a lot of folks face, if the, especially if they're outside of the Bay Area, right? And, and there's certainly examples, clearly HubSpot's may, been able to attract a lot of sales talent to Boston, but a lot of folks feel like they have to have sales in the Bay Area to attract talent and remote, or the flip side, a lot of folks selling to media have to have a team in New York, et cetera, right? So you, so you do what works, but I gotta tell you, I think it's a, a huge benefit because you want, you want, to me, until you're huge, you want your head of sales and your head of marketing to be your right and left hand man and woman, right? You want this to be integrated linked, and if you're not together, the collaboration's tough. For, grow, for growing, for, for, for hunting and farming? Um, I, I wish I had the perfect answer, but I'll tell you what, I, what, I, what I've seen and what I'm thinking. So um, I think uh, generally speaking, in most cases, I find duallys fail. So the VP of sales and marketing, that one really, like, that, that one really doesn't work out. I mean, these are not the same function, right? VP of sales and customer success, right? That's it. What's, where do I prioritize? It's really tough, right? And I think a lot of the great VP of sales want to sell. They want to close, right? And then they want their wingman to carry the customer through the life cycle because in most SaaS businesses, you know, you, you can, you'll keep the customer for years, three, four, five, seven years. Does the VP of sales really want to manage the customer forever? So I think uh, viewed tactically, I, I, I'm, I'm religiously opposed to VP of sales and marketing, and I like to have a division between sales and client success. Having said that, what I've seen lately, and at first I thought this was nutty, but now I see that it's a great idea, is more and more companies earlier, notwithstanding C title inflation, are having a, a chief revenue officer, okay, however you title it. And the chief revenue officer brings in a VP of sales under them, and the VP of sales and the VP of however you upsell reports to that person as well. Um, it's tough to do that in the early stage, but uh, I think if you can pull that off, that's a, it's, a, it's a great way to have both, right? Because ultimately in any SaaS business, the majority of your revenue is going to come at least indirectly from renewals, word of mouth, second order revenue, right? So you want someone owning that whole thing. And I think ultimately having the CO own it all is suboptimal when you scale. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, just curious. What kinds of things did you guys do for lead gen? So that's, that's my whole question. Oh, overall? Yeah, when you were at EchoSign. Um, well, um, I will tell you, I mean, I could answer a lot of questions. I'll tell you where we, what we focused on um, is we, f we were religiously focused on folks that got into the funnel and closing them, 
So we were very, very good at, however, the, uh, and I'll answer your question in a little bit more detail. You know, you do get a brand, uh, 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 or at least in the early stages, there's a concept I like to talk about and I've written about a mini brand, right? Once you get something going, even if you get to a million in revenue, a lot of people have probably heard about you. Not in the grand scheme of things, but in your little ecosystem or space. So what we, what we got really good at, especially when we got uh, the right VP of sales on board, or when I was running sales in the early days, is we got very good at the, the second someone came into the spider web, as I think about it, and luring them into the bottom, right? Um, we never really, because of that, that was what we were good at and we specialized in. We never did a ton of outbound, right? Um, and I think, uh, I think, especially when, you know, and Aaron talks a lot about this, I think especially when you get just a little bit bigger, should definitely, you know, you, you, you can't lose, or from the HubSpot conversation as a layer. Um, but mostly we focused on customer happiness, right? And building on that mini brand, and that created. Well, if you if you combine viral, um, word of mouth, SEO, and search, right? Even from like, from like, uh, maybe month nine through many tens of millions in revenue, that was 90% of our of our lead source, right? Was by keeping the keeping the existing customers happy and building on that either as a direct or indirect viral loop. You know, but we, I mean, we could talk more about it. I mean, you do everything, right? I mean, do, you know, do paid webinars work? I mean, you know, you'll get a few, right? Your, your $100,000 booth at Dream, Dreamforce, uh, you know, you, you'll, you'll get a couple. <laughs> but a lot of that stuff, it's tough in the early days to make that scale, right? Thanks. Could you talk, could you talk about increasing revenue per lead? Because you said it was kind of the single most important metric for you. So what strategies and hacks? Yeah, well, I'll talk about it, but I'll tell you um, uh, at, at the CEO or founder level, the way to do it is to hire a great VP of sales. You, you should not be doing those hacks yourself. And what a great VP of sales can do a lot of things, but what they'll almost immediately do is increase the quality of the town and the organization, right? And that alone, plus whatever other processes and training, and that stuff's all important, right? But by increasing the quality of the talent, through the higher quality town, the organization, that, that was the magic, right? And that, Brendan came in in 90 days, our revenue per lead doubled. Was that, did we, did we launch better features? <laughs> I mean, no, did we have a PR campaign? No, nothing, nothing changed, right? All that actually changed was he did bring in three folks with him that he knew that he trusted. So we immediately had three additive folks that were great to the team. So that's key, right? But I, you can't say that there's anything other than, than just quality, right? Because nothing changed in those 90 days. So we could talk about hacking, but the real hack I say is um, start hiring that VP of sales at 10 customers, right? Even though you can't hire them, that, that's the real hack is to start early. I don't know, I mean, maybe you'd like to hear more, but it's just, it's just talent, right? As John said, half your time has to be recruiting. Um, but I'll give you one little hack in the early days. I mean, I just, the one one that did ultimately you outgrow and scale, but um, if you're not doing this, um, the one hack that, that at least got us a quick boost after that was, was um, you know, if you have, uh, there, you'll figure out the number of leads that a rep can handle, okay, in your organization, right? And first of all, the second that, that, that you're giving a rep one more lead than they can handle, make sure you have another rep already there taking those leads because you don't, leads are precious, right? And then make sure that if those leads for whatever reason, because usually processes in the early days are not that well defined, right? Make sure you have a cleanup rep. And the cleanup rep's job is if that rep, for whatever reason, isn't properly followed up with in 24, 48 hours, if the second follow-up doesn't happen, boom, that lead goes to cleanup rep. And that creates this amazing virtuous cycle where all of a sudden, like the, the, the loser leads, they're never going to follow up on them, right? But the ones that are sort of the mid-pack or just below, if you're going to lose them, all of a sudden you see productivity just, just grow. So the cleanup rep in the early days was a, was a very productive hack for us. What's that? What's your hack? You got a long, a long list, I'm sure. We're closing together here, so yeah. I'm not just stealing the stage. But uh, hey, Andrew. So one, uh, by the way, on this, that article, if you saw maybe 10x. I always say, if you can increase your uh, small deals, pay the bills, but big deals help drive growth. So one way to help figure out how to increase your deal size, or as Jason would say, your revenue per lead metric, KPI, whatever is go through an exercise where you think, okay, our average deal size is $5,000 today. What would it take for in us to sell a, 50, 000, a 10 times size deal, $50,000? Which is two things. Who would actually need it? And what would we have to do to deliver that kind of value? So it starts you thinking much bigger. So instead of a, 
So if you try to 10 times it, you might get a doubling or something. But it, that's a good mental exercise for that. Uh, and there's an article, a blog post about it, predictablerevenue.com slash 10x. That's good. The, the other hack, for what it's worth, just to, you know, I, I, maybe it's, it's an obvious point to a lot in the audience, but um, invest far earlier in customer success than you would expect. Yes. Right? Yes. Because at the end of the day, it, 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 that's all that, that that's about more than half that matters, right? That's your revenue stream, that's your word of mouth, that's your brand. And everyone, in my ex experience, everyone tends to do customer success really good in the early days because it's like the CEO and the CTO, right? That's who's doing it, and one other guy. And then things get, there's this phase around three, four, five million, wherever it is for you, where things just get overwhelming, right? And you want to already have customer success processes in place before then, because otherwise you're just wasting all that hard work that you did in sales. A question about recruiting. Uh, one, one, one quick question about recruiting, if I could. When you were uh, recruiting Brendan, yeah. I, I guess you were looking at some other candidates. How did you evaluate the candidates, and why did you pick Brendan? Um, you know, at the, the there's you know the, 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 a couple reasons. One, um, I was lucky by accident. Um, uh, I had I, when I'd first spoken with him 20 months before. I instantly knew he was. He was more insightful than 90% of the candidates that I talked to way back when, so I, I had that, right? But at the end of the day, I think, um, you know, this, is, this isn't the most brilliant insight, but whenever you're trying to hire for a functional area like this, make sure that in that interview you learn amazing things and that you don't know things that that person doesn't know, right? And usually by the time you go to hire VP of sales, you know a lot, right? You may not have ever really managed an inside sales team, but you've closed a lot of customers yourself. You know how the process should go. You know what it's like at your ACV and your deal size, which is very different than an industry, different industry and a different deal size if it's transactional or solution sale. And if that, if that interviewee is in any way dumber than you on your sales, even though they should know nothing, they know nothing about your company except your website, immediately pass, right? Because the thing about pe people may challenge me, but I firmly believe that it, at a given company's size, at a given deal size, um, pretty much it's all in some ways similar, right? Um, you know, a company at two million growing 100% a year with a $5,000 average deal size, it's a pretty transactional thing. It's probably very inbound driven. There's exceptions, but th these patterns emerge and the ones that are great know how to leverage those patterns in their next gig, right? So if you don't, if, if you're smarter than them, just, just as painful as just pass. Are we out of, we're out of time, Max? Yeah. Okay, we'll do it after. Thank you.